2011, uh, Korea has invested uh, about 50 billion US dollars and has created about uh, 750,000 job, green jobs. Korea will continue to uh, spend more and more money on research and development and also eco industry sectors. Uh, this slide uh, uh, shows us the uh, international organizations and network uh, dedicated to uh, distribute the renewable energy around the world. Uh, many developing countries uh, lack the means to carry out their missions to, for increasing energy efficiency and uh, developing clean energies. Uh, Korea has closely worked with uh, international renewable energy agencies such as so-called uh, IRENA uh, as a board member uh, since its inception and the uh, UNSK also. Uh, Korea established the uh, Green Technology Center uh, this year uh, to enhance the intergovernmental cooperation and uh, share the green technology with uh, the other uh, countries. Um, uh, you know, achieving uh, a low carbon green society is a big task, of course. Uh, this can only be accomplished when we gather our strong will and carry out our mission uh, together. So I would like to finish my presentation with saying that uh, if you dream alone, it's just a dream. But if you dream together, our dream can come true. So no task is too big when done together by you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Gong Man Han, you know, particularly working together and closely and giving insight of how Korea is actually uh, trying to address the energy demands and needs for the future. I just would like to reiterate that, you know, uh, just to, by mentioning that the International Energy Agency has projected that world's energy demand will increase from 12 billion ton well equivalent in 2009 to either 18 billion or 17 billion by 2035, even with the, with the current scenario, policy scenario. At that time, the carbon emissions are expected to increase from 29 gigaton per year to 43 gigaton per year or 36 gigaton per year. This is recently published in Nature. So I think under the current and uh, new policies also, I think uh, there is a lot more to work. And I thank uh, the Director General for bringing, uh, highlighting us and uh, uh, giving you uh, very, very valuable time to this session. Now I would like to uh, shall we continue with this or question to be reserved later on? Uh, yeah. Let's continue with the time. Okay. So now I would like to invite the panelists and uh, mainly focusing on uh, three questions that we actually think based on the keynote presentation and the presentation by the Director General. Uh, how to generate more value addition to nature based product? and what type of innovative natural based options and solutions are available that can foster green growth, poverty reduction, and helps promote sustainable prosperity. Okay. So, yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I will, I will put uh, <coughs> them. And what type of policies and options actually uh, or government, governing mechanisms are required that will attract investment uh, and incentive co for conservation renovation of ecosystem services including biodiversity and how to engage the key stakeholders to promote green economy. So these are the three key areas that uh, uh, the panelist will be focusing in addition to the key messages from the uh, earlier presentation. So now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Arjurana Deoba um, for our uh, uh, you know, provoking ideas. And it will be five minutes first, and then we'll come. Okay. Uh, we'll come back later. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Oli. Um, this is where it's a challenge because we just heard the questions right now, so we're just processing it. Um, but I'd like to share some of the things that 
you know, I've been thinking about in this field. As all of us know, the last 20 years we have seen uh, disasters, fuel crisis, economic crisis, everything when I was growing up was, was the myth of science fiction. Now we see it in our lives. What has induced this? Why has the world changed so drastically in the last 20 years? There is just one answer. It's all these events that we see happening one after the other have all been man-made. We have induced the changes. The humankind, in their utter greed, have played around so much with natural resources that nature does not, cannot cope with it anymore. Thus, there has been now discussion at global levels about a paradigm shift towards a green economy. But what does it really mean? Is it going to be so easy? You know, we've seen all these international frameworks. I heard of one or two more today that I have not read about previously. The world is thinking, and it looks like we are thinking hard. But it's easy to think and, and to write policies, as all of us know. But are we really committed to making the changes? And that is the question. Is it going to be business as usual? Because we know the big businesses are even more powerful than governments, and they control the world. How are we going to really make people's greed be minimized and people's real needs stand as the number one issue that is going to drive the world? The world that we are living in and the world we hope is going to be there for us to pass on to the future generations. This is a question for us. And we have the right frameworks, at least that is now in place, even though you know the climate conference was not as well as not as fruitful as we hoped it would be. There have been some achievements, such as the Convention on Biodiversity. Country governments, uh, great leaders have made their commitment, but will they make them work? And the question that has been raised here today by the two presenters give us a lot of things to look at about what our roles could be. Who are the stakeholders and what can we do? I think most of the stakeholders here come from a community which is you know, doing science, academia. We have a role to play. You know, uh, some of the policies framed have been based on what the scientists have been telling us, you know, on fact, uh, based on data. We need more of that, more of research, more of knowledge products to convince decision makers that this is happening. We still have a lot of skeptics that the global change is not happening. But we know all of us living in our own countries are facing that every day. So that is one role, the role of the academia and the scientific bodies. The other is the role of the uh, media. How are we going to take the messages out? Are, we, are the news only going to be about political headlines? Or are the news also going to be about the changes and the economic gains that we need to do if we want to move fast enough? That is another role. The other role is people like me, people from the civil society. We are advocates. We need to be advocates fast enough and we need to take those messages out to the grassroots. Because people living in the communities are still not aware about what climate, does, uh, climate change does to them. Do we know that for every one man who dies, four women die when there's a disaster? And how are we going to make the women away? How are we going to convince country governments that there is a need to look at women's needs uh, differently when disaster strikes? So these are some of the key questions that I think we are, um, you know, like sort of trying to put our heads around. But the commitments are there, and there are just two commitments that I would like to remind all of us about. You know, I was going through all the papers to see, okay, what am I going to say today? Because I'm a social scientist, let me tell you. I'm not a, uh, you know, a natural scientist. But some of the targets that have been set out in the <coughs> strategic plan to biodiversity, if we just implement those, if our country governments are really, you know, like um, um, bound to it, I think some of the things that uh, Mr. Rautor talked about today, payment for environmental services, who is going to look after our slopes, What's going to happen to the ghost towns? I, I, I'm a politician in my, in my other life. I represent a hill community. And whenever I have to go to campaign at the end of every four years, I have to bus my voters from the plains where they live up to the mountains where they're supposed to vote. Because there are no alternatives. And we are not giving them the, pro uh, the protection required for them to um, you know, look after the slopes. And uh, much to my happy surprise, I must say, a few years ago, I attended a, a mountain conference in Munich, 
and I found out that the Alps, in the Alps there is actually a program where farmers are given big incentives to stay in their farms and farm it. So if you produce one dollar per square feet or whatever, the government gives you two dollars. Why don't we have programs like that in our part of the world? Why are we just talking about mountain development, we are talking about equity, but we are not really doing it. And we cannot do it only by ourselves. If the commitment of all the international uh, bodies and the governments are for real, let's set up a fund where mountain development also has some money attached to it, not just scientific research, which already shows that if the people are not there in the mountains, the slopes are going to fall down, then what's going to happen to all the other things that's going to be triggered by that? And just the two targets that I would like to remind ourselves of is target two of the biodiversity strategic plan, which says by 2020, which is not very far off, uh, that, the, that the biodiversity values have been integrated into national and local development and poverty reduction strategies and planning processes. <coughs> because the way we are counting economic development is not real, we know that. We are just looking at some figures, you know, mapped out in one part of the world, and the contribution that women make, that even children are making, is not counted at all. So how are we going to account for it, and how are we going to have a value to it? Unless we do things like that, I'm sure, I, I'm not hopeful that we are going to walk towards a green economy which is going to be sustainable. The other is meeting target three of the Biodiversity Sustainable Plan, that again by 2020, that there are incentives not given for harmful things. And it is quite cynical to think that we are giving incentives for overfishing and farm and uh, mining, but we are not giving incentives to keep our slopes safe. And I think that is where I will stop at now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rana, for very uh, good insights and food for thought. Now I would like to request Dr. RVS Rao uh, to be precise in time. I have to seven minutes. Seven. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I think uh, the overall picture given by Dr. Uh, Mr. Rathor has uh, is the eye opener, keeping in view all the various aspects are concerned. And uh, the success story of Korea is a, an excellent example on the basis of which we can move forward. Confining to three uh, relevant questions, and uh, I thank ECI board and especially Dr. Krishnaoli for inviting me over here and acting as a panelist. Rio plus 20 is a reality. We have already turned into Rio plus 20. And green economy is, as in most of the discussions, is taking place. Now, uh, I would go by, the first question was more like, how to make use of this past 20 years? How to link with the livelihood options? How to reduce the poverty in the mountain areas, which are fragile, which are inaccessible? Uh, connectivity problem is there and how to stop migration, as it was mentioned by the key speaker. I, as a forester, see that uh, the mountain's strength is the natural resource. And when I say natural resource, it's not merely forest. Even the mountain itself is the natural resource. Glaciers are natural resources. After all, many rivers originate from these uh, glaciers, thousands and thousands of glaciers. So, first and foremost, my endeavor or my session would be to critically identify what are the key high value products on the natural resources and how best to link with the people so that most of the issues, most of the concerns are well addressed. <coughs> the second point, uh, I would uh, uh, go for the collective wisdom optimize optimization of resources on the basis of uh, I would say the multi-sectoral integrated approach and especially when I'm talking about mountain region it has to be the landscape has to be the watershed management approach so that would be my second step so far as the first part is concerned and the second the uh, query was how to 
hard to, but I would take it third, people policies and then engaging key st stakeholders. Coming first to the key stakeholders, by now, whether it is uh, Europe or Latin America or uh, North America or Asia or any part of the world, now by now we know after in, during the last 20 years which are the key institutions at the international level. And AC Modi is one of the institutions, leading institutions, which has been created a long time back, almost 27, 28 years back. They have tremendous repository of knowledge so far as dealing with the fundamental problems of mountains are concerned. Now, identification of the key such institutions, A, maybe some of the national partners like we could give, make use of the Korean example, Korea's last 20 or 25 years experience of green economy. So that would be the, uh, I would say, the guiding principles or parameters to identify the key stakeholders at the national level, at the regional level, at the international level. And I'm not going to elaborate that, all of you know very well. And the third part, which is very, very important, is policy matters. I am for the, openly, I'm, I'm as a forester, I go for the approach of the time is now very, very crucial. Now, community-based natural resource management has to be the key buzzword, central point for the foresters, for the institutions, for the, all the people who are dealing with the uh, natural resources. So while finalizing the policy at the national level, or maybe when we uh, again assemble together, today I was told that uh, in 2015 we are going to have World Water Forum. Now by now, by then, in three years of time, March 2015, all the fundamental problems of water related issues need to be assessed and need to be analyzed on the basis of the past uh, pilot projects. So there the policy makers, the policy makers from the politicians angle, senior most bureaucrats, even the input from the research organizations, they have to be honestly admit that what are the realities. So they, the, those things have to be kept in mind. I would just like to give example of India. Uh, only two years back, uh, the then Honorable Minister of Environment and Forest, he came up with an excellent idea. Uh, and we came up with the National Action on Climate Change, NAPCC. Now, all the natural resources related issues were addressed by the Ministry of Environment and Forest in the form of NAPCC. And in the provinces, we are supposed to finalize our state action plan of climate change. Now, whether it is related to water or land or degradation or deforestation or carbon sequestration or carbon storage, blah, 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 all the points, they are supposed to be analyzed by the state governments, by the provinces, and linking with the national action plan. So the last point which uh, uh, our uh, Director General from Korea has pointed out, that the roadmap for future, uh, on the basis of all the pilot projects, how to move around, how to move forward, whether very, very, the typical problem of, say, mountain region of Himalayas, that could be uh, Bhutan or India, part of India, or Nepal, or maybe uh, Chittagong Hills of Bangladesh. So all those problems. And last point in the policy, I would propose that how best we can link REDD Plus with the natural resources, especially forestry sector. And when I say forestry sector in incentivizing the whole process, I think in time to come, there has to be some incentive mechanism so that people preserve their forest, conserve their forest, go for the forestry sector, and it becomes more, not only viable, but even excellent investment for future so far as carbon market is concerned, carbon sequestration is concerned, and it has of REDD plus is concerned. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rao, for your valuable insights. Uh, now, I would like to invite uh, Professor Jigang Jiang uh, from Chinese Academy of Science to give your thoughtful insights and how do we move ahead with the green economy in future. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it is my great honor to speak uh, in front of you. I thank uh, Dr. Pauli for inviting me. 
and uh, you know, uh, frank to say, it, you know, I was surprised. Uh, you know, I will see so many people, you know, attending this uh, uh, symposium. Green economy is a uh, simple concept. Uh, no, not many people, or I would say, that no people were uh, opposite. To it. And uh, however, uh, there might be different interpretations. Uh, what is uh, green economy, and how green uh, the economy should be? So we need a simple message, you know, to take out of this room and to take to tell everybody in the world. Uh, either educated or without uh, much education to so those people. I think green economy first means uh, less consumption. As uh, you know, in the previous talk, people said, you know, you know, we, the people on the earth, consumed too much energy, too much mineral and other materials. So they ecological footprint of human beings is 